Yeah, so I moved from here to your own. No, but I know my bald spot really desires more. It's a powder, maybe. What's that? It's a powder flavor. <laughs> When I started losing my hair, I began to see the wisdom of powdered wigs. I mean, you know, it's just everybody in the same position. It's, it's quite wise. Yeah, it's quite. It's very practical. And you don't have to waste money on shampoo. Um, okay. Well, welcome to. God, you can actually know what the sixth spe fifth speaker for We have only seven, so fourth fourth speaker in um, the IP Fall Speaker Series. And this time, we really need when we say something new and different. We really do have something um, new and different. Um, I'm going to footnote myself as an academic prerogative and just make a comment. Dan, I have used that machine like 12 times and I never put on the microphone. So I did the headphones. So you look very cool. I just think Thank I, you. Like, I, I've never thought. Thank that. you. That's just all we people need. I'll edit this out. I'm actually live streaming this, so too late. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> too late. <laughs> oh, it's right here. Actually, actually it's right here. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. This is on Google Live right now. Yes. Okay, well, hello to everybody following on the internet. Robert Richards, are you there? <laughs> Here he liked it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we've all had enough of that. You know, law professors try to introduce themselves. Okay, next. Mo moving on. Josh Blackman really is something new and different. Uh, yeah, he is sort of a leader in the you know, field of legal prediction. Um, and for those of you in the seminar who will read whatever the paper, this is something that has the potential of changing the way law is practiced. Um, we will be exchanging um, the expert advice of highly paid um, uh, counselors uh, as far as litigation outcomes and regulatory outcomes with very well-trained computers. Uh, and we see this already in a variety, we've seen it for years in a variety of ways like, from you know, meteorology to elections. Um, and now the question is whether this will also carry over to everyday litigation and sort of questions that lawyers face um, as part of their job. So without further ado, Josh Blackman. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you for that warm welcome. I don't think I really deserve it. Um, thank you to Dan and Renee and Adam, everyone, for inviting me. I think it's very fitting that I give this talk here because you at Michigan State have a very unique perspective of how the future of law will be practiced. I mean, you're all here in law school, you're learning how to be attorneys, you're learning how to do all the things that lawyers do. Yet I think you, perhaps more than anyone else, has a realization that a lot of what you do is not something specific that only people can do. My talk today is in something I call assisted decision making. Assisted decision making is using technology to improve on how lawyers make decisions. This is not replacing attorney judgment or supplanting attorneys altogether. That's maybe for another talk. This is simply letting attorneys make more informed decisions with big data. What's big data? The use of large amounts of knowledge which no one person can possibly understand in some sort of algorithm that can expand on it and make things more precise. So let's go back all the way to 1897. I hope you've all read this at some point in your careers, but if you haven't, take a look at it. It's Oliver Wendell Holmes. Um, and he really encapsulates what it is that attorneys do. What do we do? Attorneys predict. I don't care what you do as an attorney, you're going to have a client. And the client will say, tell me what's going to happen. Will I win this case or will I lose this case? Will this contract be upheld or not? Will this insurance policy be valid or not? Uh, will I have to pay taxes on this? Uh, will I go to jail? Um, will this deal close? Everything that attorneys have to do is premised on our understanding of what will happen. And how do attorneys make those predictions? based on our law school knowledge, based on research. We study how courts have decided similar cases in the past, and we improve on it, and elaborate, and say, based on these precedents, here's what's going to happen. This is a common law system. This is a system which we're trained to work with. But as we all know, this knowledge is imperfect. It's impossible for any one attorney to have that wide range of a knowledge. It's just impossible. So what happens? We have large groups of attorneys law firms call them, who have more knowledge. Maybe we have an academy who can kind of aggregate a lot of this knowledge and write articles and bar journals and like try and make this knowledge accessible. But even still, it's going to be very difficult for you to know exactly what's going to happen because there's only a finite amount any one given person can do. 
Big data, though, allows for a new dynamic here. It can be changed. If you look at things like Intrade, and I'll talk about fancy SCOTUS, which is something I run a few minutes, you now have large amounts of data from lots of people aggregated in a very specific place answering very simple questions. Westlaw can't do that. Lexis can't do that. All they do is give you millions of reported cases and say, here, have fun. Try and do a keyword search and find what you want to do. But they're not answering questions. Assistive decision making will help you answer questions of what will happen for your specific case. This is actually one of my favorite pictures. It's actually a Norman Rockwell painting from 1927. Uh, it's of the, of the studying law students. I love how Abraham Lincoln's in the back because Lincoln was a lawyer and that's the guy, you know, he's aspiring to be like Lincoln. Um, I hope none of you are huddled over barrels reading law books at night. If you are, you're probably in the wrong spot. But this is how many educators view the law school model. This is how my mother did it. This is how my grandmother did it. So my great grandmother did it. This is how legal education must proceed. You must study books, rules, and be very formulaic. But this really isn't the world we're living in. It's probably quicker for you to Google the holding of a case than it would be for you to actually search for it on Westlaw sometimes. It's probably quicker for you to find some uh, template of a contract that might be worthwhile on Google than it would be for you to draft from scratch or check a form book. Technology makes these decisions go so much quicker. Now, I'm, I'm almost certain you cited this guy, Richard Susskind. He's written a number of books about how law is evolving. Um, this is his most recent book, or I think there's another one after this, called The End of Lawyers. Um, the title is a little bit, uh, uh, you know, do doomsday, the end of lawyers. But don't worry, you're not, you're not quite out of a job yet. But I think you're going to need to learn how to evolve and improve your ability to um, use this technology to make yourselves in much better shape. Um, another article, which I hope you've read, uh, by the late Larry Ripsian and Bruce Kobayashi called Laws, Information, Revolution. Um, this article really spells out how data can be used as a means of of enabling lawyers to work smarter and better. No longer will you be bound by just remembering this precedent and this precedent. You can actually ask questions and what will happen to these factors. The same way you can do a Google query, that's what the assistive decision making will provide. So how do we get there? We need to disrupt the market. We need to have things that change the way people look at the law. If we just keep doing things the old fashioned way, if we have Westlaw and Google and you know, Thomson Reuters spent nine years building Westlaw Next, and it's as if you were searching Yahoo like in 1995. It's not really, it's not really that much of an improvement for Westlaw old, but that's what they got, and that's the state of the art, because their entire model is premised on librarians manually indexing cases. You ever see the head notes at the top of Westlaw? Those are written by people. They have thousands and thousands of research librarians They're in Egan, Minnesota, and they spend lots of time indexing and reporting cases. If Google were to build their model on having people manually index the internet, we wouldn't have Google. It wouldn't exist. The model that Westwell uses is premised on having you know, data by humans. I actually spoke with a data scientist, Thomson Reuters, and he told me there's a huge struggle internally about how much is going to be attributed to computers and how much is attributed to humans. And there's this inherent you know, feeling that we need to have human judgment. I think as I'll show you in this presentation, the need for human judgment isn't as integral at the early research stage as perhaps some might think it to be. So first let me talk about something I built a couple years ago on a LARC. Uh, anyone here ever hear of Fantasy SCOTUS? One of you? Yeah? Yeah, I mean Michigan State. Yeah, I think I think it's actually a Michigan State team. I mean we have uh, so for those of you who don't know, if you haven't you didn't do your homework. Uh, fantasy SCOTUS is the Supreme Court Fantasy League. I built this almost as a lark because I'm a huge Supreme Court nerd. Um, I actually noticed the, the, the replica of Moses when you first walk into the hallway. I'm pretty sure that's an exact replica of the Moses sculpture at the uh, Supreme Court in the freeze. It was actually considerable debate of whether it's even constitutional. I'm pretty sure it's an exact replica. But anyway. Okay. You the horns? Those are actually there. Yes. Well, that, and also, if you, if you look at Michelangelo's Dave, there are actually yeah, many points there. Yeah, but they're the freeze, too. I just wondered, are they going to the Supreme Court one? I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure, okay. Yeah, that was actually a, well, I'll, I'll get to that later. <laughs> <laughs> I do know the history of that, Bob. That'll, that'll be for later. So, fancy SCOTUS is just that. It's a way to predict how the Supreme Court will decide cases. Every case that's argued for the court, you make a prediction. After I built it, I didn't really expect many people to join. 
But somehow, within about 24 hours, over 1,000 people signed up. It was actually, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't expect it at all. But once I did, I said, holy crap, I have data. Uh, myself and my friend Corey, we were just looking at this and saying, wow, we have so much data right now. We could do something with this. And I'd recently read some books on crowdsourcing, like The Wisdom of the Crowds by James Terwicki, and said, hey, what if we just crowdsource this and just kind of aggregate all this data and make predictions? You know, wouldn't it be possible to actually, you know, offer predictions on how the court will decide? Now, you ask something like in-trade, which exists, but they only have markets for the big cases, like a healthcare case or, you know, a uh, big criminal procedure case. But for the rent or risk case, which no one really cares about, they always have like three of those a term, you need some way to make predictions. So ba based on the wisdom of the crowds, we look, how do people think they're going to vote? You know, enough people think the justice will vote this way, enough people think they vote this way. In any given crowd, there'll be some right, some wrong, some in the middle, some better, some worse. But it all averages out. I think on the healthcare case, I think, no, I think on Citizens United, we had over 1,500 predictions. That's a, it's a wide range of people. And not just lawyers, political scientists, philosophers, uh, engineers, people from all walks of life who have knowledge of how the court might do it. It's almost Hayekian in how this distribution of local knowledge is kind of consolidated uh, into, one, into one engine. This is a market to assemble this data. And when you have over 14,000 people making predictions, they get pretty good. Um, if you look at the people who make uh, predictions on 75% of the cases, we call these our power predictors, they're at 70 to 80% accuracy. That, that beats anyone. Um, even Tom Goldstein, who runs SCOTUS blog, we beat him. Um, yeah, we beat him actually by, by, not, by a not insignificant margin. Uh, and he doesn't make predictions too much because he knows he can be wrong. He actually gave an interview uh, in the Atlantic about two weeks ago where he said the good thing about making predictions is when you're right, everyone gives you credit. It's not an exact quote. He said when you're right, everyone gives you credit. When you're wrong, everyone forgets. And that's one of the, the most important aspects of being a pundit. People will never remember when you're wrong. Pay attention to all the people making predictions for the election. Half of them will be wrong. And I guarantee you, after November 6th, they'll still be on TV making more bad predictions. We have a track record. You know, we have, we have a very clear prediction of how each case will come out. You think in this case, it'll be an affirm. By the way, green means correct, red means wrong. That's just a color coding. Right, correct, 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 correct. You can go through every case and see exactly what our predictions were at every date and, and see how accurate we are. We, we, we make our record available to the world. We want people to say, listen, this is a cool product. This is something which people can rely on. Uh, this is our tracker for the healthcare case. Um, it was funny. I presented at uh, the, the reInvent Law Lab uh, conference in London, Law Tech Camp, and it was actually present, presenting the day after this case was decided. Uh, it was perfect timing. Um, and our prediction for this case was we don't know. We had no, we had no significant data which is actually very, very important because a lack of significant data tells you that it's uncertain. And that's pretty plus what happened. It's actually a pretty good prediction. Um, but we actually tracked it every single day from November to June, how things went up and down. And if you look right around here, you see a little bit of a drop in that. That was the day of oral arguments. You can actually break it down to even the minute of how the day proceeded of when predictions were made in the court. Uh, you know, pie charts, all these graphs. This is using data. This is crowdsourcing. Um, even looking at uh, the main question, is the mandate unconstitutional, you can see how the day was argued, the number jumped up. Because everyone said, hey, the Supreme Court's going to strike this down. You can see each individual user by their rank. So you know how much weight to give each person. People who are ranked higher can be weighted more. And we know that people who are ranked higher have made better predictions. And after we've done this now, we're actually in our fourth year. I can't even believe it. We have a, a cadre of about 10 or 15 people done it every year. And they keep coming back and making excellent predictions. And we know they are. And we can definitely uh, rely on this. Um, part of me wants to turn this into a commodities market, uh, but I don't think it'd be legal. Um, if you know about in-trade, they're actually based in Ireland. And it's unclear if what they're doing is even legal in the United States. The DOJ has given mixed signals if uh, betting on non-sporting events is, con is legal. Uh, the, the, the wire fraud statute is drafted pretty broadly. So it's probably not legal, but I'm not willing to risk it. But in any event, this crowdsourcing has limits. What are our limits? First, we're limited by the number of people in our crowd. Lots of people like the Supreme Court. Not so many people like the Courts of Appeals, and almost no one like federal district courts. There's not going to be enough of a critical mass of people making predictions about lower courts. It's just impossible. What's another prediction? Incentives. 
people like playing this because it's fun. It's engaging. You know, it's something they can brag to their friends about. There are law school leagues. You can get, some law schools actually give out uh, points out to uh, uh, their you know Westlaw uh, bonus points for participating. So crowdsourcing has its limits, but really what comes next is something which I think you all appreciate deeply, and this is data by itself. And this is using data to make better decisions, that is assisted decision making. There's a lot of data available. All we have to do is harness it and figure out how to write algorithms to tell us what's going to happen. This is something which can impact attorneys across the board. If any attorney can say with some degree of certainty what will happen, even if it's just his own anecdotal evidence, but he has some knowledge behind it, some data, to be much better suited to serve his clients. And how do we get there? We need to look to super crunching. I don't know if anyone's ever seen this book about Ian Ayers, Super Crunchers. I, I highly recommend it. It's very good. Um, this looks at how data can be used to improve life. There's one example. Uh, any onophiles here, people like wine? Okay. So, you know, for years there were a bunch of onophiles and experts who said, we know what the best vintages of wine will be. We know, you know, this vintage will be good and this vintage will be good, so we you know, buy lots of these cases in advance. This guy wrote an algorithm. What did it do? It looked at factors like weather, soil composition, amount of precipitation, various climate factors. And he actually calculated a formula of how good a vintage of wine will be. And they ran this year after year. And this guy, this data scientist, he destroyed the winemakers. He, he had such better predictions and he was very accurate. What do you think they tried to do? They basically blacklisted the guy. They wouldn't let him publish any of their wine journals and they kicked him out. Why? Because he was encroaching. I use this example because I think it probably speaks to what attorneys will do in a couple of years. <laughs> Once attorneys figure out that they're, that they're charging hundreds of dollars an hour for something that can be done in a few seconds, they're not going to be too happy about it. And that's something which I want all of you to appreciate. Um, the regulatory challenges and the uh, attacks and their unauthorized practice of lawsuits uh, will come. Uh, we will be ch people like in this field will be challenged as unauthorized practice of law. It's inevitable. Um, I'm already thinking about other things about that. But you already see with LegalZoom. Follow LegalZoom. They're already getting sued by state bars for, for authorizing. I'm sorry for practicing law without license, even though just providing forms. Wait till a computer, you know, like Watson, for example, can give you legal advice. Wait till that. We'll see. We'll see what happens if the state bars figure that out. out. And you can now take out your, you know, your smartphone, you know, and ask it a question and it'll tell you exactly what's up. But I'll get more there in a minute. So the key is using data to make decisions. And fortunately and unfortunately we have a source. The source is Pacer. Has anyone ever used Pacer? I'm sorry. It's <laughs> so there, there's a lot of, I was, before I taught, I was a federal uh, law clerk for three years. I clerked in federal, uh, federal court for three years. So I know a lot about this stuff. Uh, probably too much. Um, Pacer is this massive database that every single filing in the federal courts is stored in this huge, gargantuan database. But it's not really one database, it's actually 90-something databases, because each court has their own, they're not actually connected. That, that'd be nice, so I'm overstating, but it's just one huge, massive system. I think in 2011, there were over 300,000 cases filed. And, and each, each case has, you know, hundreds of pleadings, and each pleading has a PDF of many pages. Um, it sounds like a lot, but it's actually not. Um, when I was clerking in, uh, in Kentucky, uh, one of the guys in the IT actually took me to the server room, and there was a rack, you know, this big, and at every filing in the Western District of Kentucky, it was like not, maybe like three or four racks. It wasn't that big. So we're talking about a lot of information, but not that much data. I mean, it was in the, I think it was in the hundreds of gigabytes. It wasn't even a terabyte of data. It was, you know, not not stuff that could fit on your on your on your MacBook Air, basically. The problem, though, is several fold. One, it ain't free. Not only is it not free, it's charged in one of the most bizarre payment schemes you can imagine. By page. Every page of a PDF you download, you pay 10 cents. Per page. So remember, I don't remember this, but in the olden days, you went to the library and you wanted to make a copy, right? You would pay like a, a dime a page. You never do that? 
they apply that same model to downloading pages from the internet. So if you download a 10-page document, you pay a dollar. A dollar for a 10-page document. That's very expensive. Not only is it expensive, it's not open. What do I mean by that? There's no API. There's no gateway. Um, I can talk to you later about how exactly you can get information from it, but it's quite, quite onerous. And if you ever try to search for stuff on Westlaw or Lexis and you see that the records are incomplete, that's the reason why. It's not easy to get and it's not cheap. After an opinion is published, it's very easy to get the data because there's a reported opinion, it's put online, uh, the courts by statute can't charge for opinions. But all the good stuff, all the data about how the litigation proceeds, that's off limits. And I guess it's fitting that's what I'm going after. So this is what PACER looks like. Um, I just took the, uh, this is called a DACA sheet. I took the DACA sheet from the Oracle versus Google case because it was a big, big deal over the summer. A bunch of techies are aware of it. This contains so much information and it's absolutely wasted because it's not put in any kind of database that can be used to crunch it. All that's spit out is this. You know, this tells you a lot of things. You know, where's the case file? What's the docket number? Uh, who are the parties? Who are the judges involved? Uh, what date was it filed? Is there a jury demand? Um, you know, what's the nature of the suit? What's the cause of action? These all have codes associated with them to say exactly what the nature of the case is. For everything that's entered, there's another record. Complaint was filed on this date, and that little number one with a link, that's actually to the PDF. You know, uh, a summons was issued. You know, there's all these things that happen. So let's just focus on this for a second. You put your data hats on. We have think date something's filed, and we have a brief description. I think Michael Bomarito was here a couple days ago. Think this through. How difficult, or how hard would it be to have some sort of engine to read this and say, okay, the complaint was filed on August 12th. The computer now knows what that means. The case began on August 12th because there was a complaint. Something happened later that relates to this. See there are always these little hyperlink numbers that relate back? Okay. ADR, which is alternative dispute resolution, was scheduled based on complaint number one. So now we have a data tree. You know, things are linked. We now know these two items are connected. The courts aren't really doing this, but I am, because this data is there. It's not easily available, but it's, it's available, and you can figure a lot of stuff. Because right now, everything is just going down a drain. There's nothing being done by it. If you ask any practicing attorney, they'll cringe when you talk about PACER because it's so difficult. There's just no way of making it do what you want. You have to just go through 14 different screens to download a simple PDF, and you have to pay for it every time. So let's do it. Let's view. Let's view the law as data. Let's try and, you know, let's be like Neo, okay? We got to, you know, be in the matrix, view this in a way that, uh, you know, there is no spoon. There's just bits, there's just zeros and ones. Um, I don't mean to oversimplify and say that the practice of law is mechanical or that you know, jurisprudence and legal theory are, can be reduced to bits and zeros and ones. I'm not saying that. What I am saying, though, is that a lot of what's discussed about the law can be reduced to zeros and ones. If you have a simple description spelling out, you know, a complaint was filed and it's a one-sentence description written by a court uh, deputy, that's not like understanding the natures of substance of due process or individual liberty. It's not understanding justice and you know, access to the courts. It's a simple statement saying a complaint was filed. And that's language we can reduce. So I'm going to break down a docket sheet and we can walk through this one at a time. So right up there, that's the very top. This tells us a lot of things. You know, who are the parties are? Who are the judges? What's the cause of action? When was it filed? Is there a jury being demanded? What court has it been filed in? That little box there tells you so much information. Because now, instead of having one of these boxes, you have 310,000 of these boxes. And you know every single court, of, uh, every single action filed in every single court in every country. I'm sorry, in every state. If you aggregate that same little box among all the courts, you now have a sense of the entire corpus of federal litigation. What kind of suits are being filed in what states? Uh, you know, what judges have most cases? Uh, uh, where are parties following most suits in a certain cause of action? The courts 
The courts release some of this data, but it's not at all uh, drilled down. It's very generalized. Here, we can generate very sophisticated queries to do everything that a law firm would want. Okay, so let's talk about litigation. You've all taken CivPro, I, I assume. So you know the first thing that happens in any federal litigation is a complaint is filed. Complaints filed for patent copyright infringement against Google. So do we know that? Oracle has sued Google. But that would not be hard to teach a, a computer to read and understand what happened. Okay? Oracle filed at Oracle. And there's an attachment. When was it filed? August 18th. Okay? We know that. But now the computer knows that there's been a suit filed. What's next? As you probably know, the next key juncture in the civil uh, uh, procedure case is the motion to dismiss under Rule 12. So, we know a couple things. Between August 12th and October 4th, roughly two months elapsed. So we know in this court, roughly two months elapsed between a complaint and a motion to dismiss. That's very valuable data. And who filed the motion to dismiss? Google. What else do we know? A motion hearing was set for uh, November 18th. Okay, so now this judge likes to set hearings about a month and a half after a motion's filed, and that he actually holds hearings. Not all judges have hearings. Okay, so now we've learned something about how this judge operates. What happens next? 14 days later, which is actually governed by, by the rules of procedure, a memorandum was filed in opposition to the motion. So now we have an idea of how the motion practices work by Oracle, and we know exactly what they filed. Okay, what happens next? November 17, 2010. Lightning fast. Less than you know, three weeks after the memorandum in opposition to dismiss was filed, the court issued an order denying the motion to dismiss. Okay, so now we know how quickly does this judge act? One of the, as a law clerk, one of the most grading questions I got was when an attorney called saying, what's the status of our motion? When are you going to rule on it? Don't ever do that. Never ask that question for your lawyer because the judges hate it. Because they're obviously busy. And no matter how important your case is, it's something more important. But now, an attorney can simply say, okay, Judge Alsa, here's how quickly he rules on things, on average, a month. So I won't call before that. That's a way of not pissing off a judge with data. They'll like that. I, I can't tell you how many lawyers will call and say, uh, how, when will this be resolved? And the, and the answer is always, criminal cases take precedence. That's always what we would say. Um, and, then we, and they never like that because you know, their, their clients are waiting. So just from these, you know, Five segments on one docket sheet, we're able to explore so many aspects of how litigation proceeds for this judge. You know, we know what the cases are, uh, motions, um, you know, the opinions, dates, judges, firms, lawyers. We know so many things. I mean, I didn't even mention it, but right here, Richard Ballinger. We know the name of an attorney for a firm. That's very valuable. Knowing what attorney is representing what client, you can't really get that anywhere else. And they're going to be really pissed off once they figure this out, too. Um, they're going to be really, really pissed off because they don't... There's actually um, a lawsuit now in the Southern District of New York for Judge Rakoff where an attorney who, I'm not kidding you, copyrighted a brief he wrote is suing Westlaw for, for, for a violation of his copyright because they're, they're selling his briefs without his permission. I'm not kidding you. Uh, there was a class action in part, which was dismissed because they didn't, they didn't copyright, but actually there were some attorneys who actually took the liberty of copywriting briefs they wrote and are now suing Westlaw. Um, once attorneys figure out that their tricks and trades will be displayed for the world to see in very clear form, they're not going to like it. Um, so that will also be down the road. Okay? So let's kind of just view this graphically. So we have a case, right? Think of you, if you ever have like a, a entity relationship designs and database, if you ever study that, we have a case. Case related to a court. So we, now we know two things. We know in every court, we know what the cases are, and for every case we know what courts it is. We can then relate this data. As PACER exists now, each court has a separate database. If you want to search pending litigation in all district courts, you'd have to run about 97 queries. There's no easy way of doing it. You have to search each court separately. And their search engine sucks. There, there, there is no good search engine. You can search by party name. But now, if we index this data, we can do a search of all courts for any given case. Okay. Also by judges. We can search for things in different ways. We can search for all the cases a judge currently has or has had in the past. Or we can search for all the cases by that judge. Say you want to file a personal injury case. You know, 
and you know, I get assigned judge so and so, and I want to know will this judge be favorable to my case? You run a query. You see how often has he granted judgment in favor of your of plaintiffs? How often has he denied those cases? How often have these cases gone to trial? If they went to trial, what was the jury amount? Maybe if you find that information about the judge, you might follow motion for change of venue. You might follow it somewhere else. You know, I clerk a lot, and I clerked in court in Pennsylvania, and I always have a friend who's like, hey, I have a, I have a case for a judge so-and-so, what's he like? That's a very common question that attorneys ask. What's this judge like? And it's always anecdotal, because maybe, you know, this guy had one case from a couple years ago, and that person had another case. Here, you know everything they've done, all aggregated in one place. And you can see with certainty how they've ruled before. And when choosing a venue called you know, virtual cyber shop, uh, forum shopping, you can see exactly what's going to happen. Next, law firms. And this can come into play several different ways. One, say you're a GC. And say you want to see if your law firm's actually up to snuff. You might want to see, how often has this law firm appeared before this judge? Or, how often has this law firm appeared in this court? Or, how often has this law firm litigated these types of cases? It's going to be all interconnected. Perhaps you're an attorney and you're going up against another firm. You want to say, wow, uh, you know, they filed suit against me in the middle district of Idaho or whatever, and I've never been there. What's this firm like? Oh, wow, they've won eight cases in front of this judge. Maybe we should settle. Or maybe you'll see that uh, you know, a certain firm has been sanctioned by a judge before you say, yeah, let's go for it. Or maybe you'll see that a certain firm has had a lot of discovery disputes. And it gets even more precise, attorneys. Attorneys have styles of how they litigate cases. Um, say you have an attorney who has litigated personal liability cases in front of Judge Alsop in the Northern District of California, then you know exactly what he's done before. You can see, wow, this guy drags discovery act. He files all these motions for protective orders and motions to compel. That's a style. Or settlement. He always settles on the eve of trial. He never settles before. How do you know this? Because settlements are recorded in the record, you know the date. If you see that trial scheduled for Friday, or I'm sorry, trial scheduled for Monday, and the settlement's entered in on Sunday, you know what happened. So now you can actually have profiles of how attorneys operate. And this is going to be devastating, because if you know how the other guy operates, you now have the upper hand, looking at his cards. Attorneys tend to do the same things over and over again. That's how they make their business. And this, these are their trade secrets, if you will, but they're not so secret. What about parties? The case I mentioned about Google and Oracle, okay, if any of you are summer associates or first year associates and your boss asks you, can you tell me all the lawsuits that Google's currently involved in? Good luck. That'll probably take you a couple weeks. That's a query that can run in a couple seconds. Tell us, list all the actions against Google that are currently pending and describe the nature of them and, you know, what judges have appeared in front of. That's, that's a query that can be done in a few seconds. That's not like a weak project. This is something which very quickly can be done. And also people. You know, and this one will be even tougher to describe, but in the course of litigation there are lots of people involved. For example, expert witnesses. Whenever you're an expert witness in any federal court, you have to go to something called a Daubert hearing, which says, is this guy's credentials good enough to testify, right? They submit CVs. Those CVs are valuable. Very valuable. You can create a database of all expert witnesses who have testified in this cause of action. What are you going to know? Have, how many times do they have to get to testify? How many times are they disqualified on Daubert? Are they earning their fee? How many times have they testified and they lost? I mean, there are some cases where with an expert witness is kicked out, you lose your case. If an expert's excluded, your case is done. Uh, relatedly, attorney's fees. Whenever an attorney wants fees, they're never humble that thing with the ratings. But usually attorneys never say what their rate is. So, look for an attorney, a motion fee. When they file a, fee, uh, a motion to get attorney's fees, that's, that's it. I talked with one guy who runs a, um, a, a program that helps assess market rates for attorney's fees. This is something that would be very valuable to him, because now you know how much your attorney's charging compared to the market. They're getting ripped off. So, I'm, I'm talking theoretically, but I'm actually doing this because I think it can be quite lucrative and I, I like doing stuff that, that's cool in addition to actually having fun. Um, so I'm actually developing a product called Harlan.co. Uh, it's a live website and a beta I'll show you a demo in a minute. But this site is probably one of the first iterations of what I'm calling assistant decision making. Okay? 
it's a way to visualize the data in a docket sheet. So rather than having that ugly, you know, row after row after table, you have, a, you have a very sleek interface. But it's not just there because it's sleek. It also gives you a lot of information. First, it doesn't give you every single entry in the database. Most of the stuff is useless. You're not going to use it. What this does is it puts out the most important thing, complaints, motion to dismiss, uh, motion to summary judgment, or cut off there. It talks about the docket, judges, firms, attorneys, parties. It gives you the key information. Let me just break this down for you. Here, instead of having a single row saying motion to dismiss denied, we have a preview of the PDF right there. That's the opinion. We have the happen, what happened, the date, and we have a brief description. And this is pulled right from the docket. You don't need to dig. It will pull forward the most important information. It will know what you're looking for. Also, I have it arranged in a timeline. That way, you can scroll through the litigation and view with a very simple ease. As well, you can learn about the judges. We aren't just going to be collecting you know, data about parties and attorneys. We're collecting data about judges as well. You know, biographical information is easy enough to find, but statistical information isn't. You know, how many cases does this judge currently have open? How often has he ruled on cases before a uh, you know, track liability case? How often does he rule for the plaintiff or the defendant? You know, how often do his cases go to trial? Some judges never let stuff go to trial. Some judges always let stuff go to trial. Those are important things to know. That's why you can learn about law firms. Who are the different attorneys in this law firm in this case? You know, what other cases are they currently involved in? Have they litigated for this judge before? Again, this is stuff I just pulled right from the data. There's no, there's no calculation even being done here. That's why this is actually pretty straightforward to do. Uh, later it gets tougher, but this is, this is actually technically not that forward looking. You know, attorneys, who's the guy? What motions has he filed? Has he ever appeared before this judge before? You know, what's his hourly rate? Uh, David Boyce is probably more than any of you could even fathom. Uh, you know, parties. What cases are Google involved in? Where else are they being sued? What are they being sued for? Will this affect them? If we know that they've settled a, a case in a certain nature in this way, maybe we should pursue that the same way. Um, there's no good way of doing this now. I'm actually going to do a little demo. Just a little exit. Here you go. So this is actually uh, going to blow up that. So this is actually the interface. And it's not giving me a good way to scroll everything. So I'm going to just scroll down to here. But you'll find that along the bottom, there are um, ways to kind of scroll along. We know a, a complaint was filed here, right? Then we scroll forward to the opposition motion to dismiss. And it's there. And then we scroll there. Here's why I use screenshots, so I know those will work. So the point is, each entry is another, almost like a slide, and you can quickly scroll through the entire litigation. There it goes. You can just scroll from one to the next, one to the next, and each time it jumps below. So you can actually see the entire litigation, all the way from when you know the complaint was filed, right back in uh, August of 2010. You can just scroll one to the next. Opposition to motion to dismiss. Motion to dismiss. You know, motion for summary judgment, response to motion for summary judgment, order granting summary judgment. You can then calculate how many days have elapsed. Uh, you keep going forward. The trial began. Jury deliberations. Trial concluded. Now you know the entire litigation is represented visually. Um, this is infinitely easier than anything Pacer has or Westlaw or, 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 or Lexis. It just it, this, this doesn't really even come close. Um, as well, you can view information about judges. Who are the judges involved in the case? You know, where are their backgrounds? Where are they from? Who are you in front of? This is a quick snapshot of everything about the case. Uh, who are the firms involved? You know, Morris and Forrester. They have these old, old five of these attorneys. Here are other cases, MoFo's, Morris and Forrester, the, the, the short name is actually MoFo. I'm not, I'm not being mean. Uh, that's, that's actually what they like to be called. They're based in San Francisco. You know, statistics. You know, Boyd Schiller. Who are the attorneys? You know, David Boyd. You click his name. You know about him. What else? Yeah, King and Spalding. The attorneys working for that firm. You know, Greenberg Trial. We have all the firms. We know about the attorneys. We can even see biographies of each, each lawyer. You know, David Bowes right there. The, uh, he and Ted Olson argue Bush v. Gore. 
might be in the news very soon, actually. Um, you know, maybe, maybe not. You know, who are the attorneys? Who are you going up against? This spreads an instant snatch of everything going on in the case. And who are the parties? Oracle, Google. These are the people being sued, and these are people being involved in the case. You can now see with some level of specificity exactly what's going on at any given time in real time. Because if you ever tried to check Westlaw in the, in the you know, intermediacy of a case, they're not updated. They update it once in a while. When the opinion is published, they'll put it. But there's no like, daily way of updating the docket sheet. You have to physically manually monitor it. Okay? So let's go back to this presentation, and I'm going to walk you through um, where I see this going um, in the near future. Um, the future of assistance decision making goes much further than simply understanding what courts have done in the past. It will be like answering questions. And I like to use the example of Siri. If any of you have iPhones, you'll know what that is. You ask it a question. You say, Siri, what's the weather like? You don't search for what's the weather in Lansing, Michigan. You say, Siri, what's the weather like? And it knows what you want. Or, or one of my favorite examples, Google. You ever, you ever use Google now? on Jelly Bean, if I search for a flight information, so this morning I searched for Delta flight, you know, 55 whatever. I, I did search for it to check it was on time. When I got into my car and pulled out my GPS, Google lists for me the top places I want to go. What do you think the first place it listed for me was? The airport. And actually even better, it listed the parking place where you should park near the airport. I didn't even need to tell it. Google knew because I searched for a flight going from Houston to Detroit that was probably going to the airport, and it listed the airport, and then the place where I park near the airport. This is helping you make decisions. This is, this is not science fiction. This is something I just did this morning. If, if, if a computer system knows your patterns and what you want to do with your day, it can give you better information. So this is a little demonstration of what I call an intelligent litigation system, called Harlan, if you will. Um, and I gratuitously use the iPhone 4S, which is no longer the newest one, and I should get the new skinny one that's even taller, but, but pardon the, the old slide. So say, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with like document production services, you know, programs that will generate contracts or deeds or wills or, or things like that. So let's, let's use an example. The way those programs work now is that there are a series of, you know, blanks, you have to fill in each blank at a time. But what if it was simple? What if, like, you know, you just took out your phone, Sorry, I have, I have an Android. I don't actually use an iPhone, but it's a better visual. And he said, you know, I want to draft a contract with these specifications, right? You don't really know what you're going to do, but you want to just draft a contract. Okay, so computers have some follow-up questions. This simulates what would happen if you actually walk into a lawyer's office. If you walk into a lawyer's office and say, I want to make a contract, they're going to ask you questions saying, well, what about this, what about this, what about that? The type of questions they're asking you aren't things that are entirely novel and original, there are things which have been asked before, thousands of times. So if we know what these questions are, and can figure out what they are, why can't Siri or Harlan ask you those questions? You know, where will the contract be executed? What kind of remedies do you want if there's a breach? Do you have insurance? And I only listed three here, but there can be a lot more. And these will be very finite and specific questions that are going to be geared to what you want to do. And rather than having to pay an attorney $450 an hour to listen to your questions, you can ask this. Okay? And you can draft the contract for you right there. This is what kind of legal zoom is doing uh, in kind of a, a nascent form. But these questions can actually be derived not from attorneys programming it, but from understanding how the case law works. When it asks, where will the contract be executed, it's not just asking idly. It understands that there are 50 different jurisdictions and it knows what the contract law is in each jurisdiction that could pull the relevant case law. It's not just ad, idly asking about insurance. It knows how insurance law works in each state and what kind of insurance you would need for these contracts. These are very specific judgments which can be learned from how data is viewed. Uh, and also something which I think is very important is access to justice, giving non-lawyers the ability to interact with the law. And, and this technology can really change the way that works. Because now, rather than having to rely on attorneys or staff or you know, staff attorneys or, or, or legal aid, a lot of this can be done on an iPhone. So say, you know, a person has a problem. You know, my landlord won't fix my heat. Or perhaps more salient example, FEMA won't pump out my basement in Long Island. 
Um, my, my family's from New York, and my aunt lives in uh, Seagate, Coney Island, and her house was just wiped out. I mean, she has five feet of standing water in her basement. Um, she's going to have a very hard time navigating the bureaucracy to get whatever aid uh, uh, is being offered to her. I know she is, because she she's not a lawyer, and she's not going to know to call. If you have a problem, you know, your landlord won't fix your heat, who do you call? You might call the city. They're not going to help you. You might call some sort of agency. They're not going to really give you advice. You have an app. Well, so you have several options. Here's who you call. There's an entire department for tenants' rights. Or, if your land won't fix your heat, I have a template of a demand letter saying that if you don't fix my heat, I'll sue into the Fair Housing Law. It's probably very routine. It's not going to be very specific. There's only so many ways you can say, fix my damn heat. Or, if that doesn't work, you can file a pro se suit, small claims court. That's a very simple action to give you step by step of what to do. Or, if all else fails, here we vetted some contact, uh, some housing lawyers who have done work on a, on a low bono or pro bono basis. Maybe contact them. So rather than having to go down to a you know a legal aid office and wait for eight hours, you can find the information immediately, and then you can just choose what you want to do. So the the promise really of, of assisted decision making is quite bold, and the entry in the beginning is simply just kind of a starting off point. And I think with you're learning from such people as these professors here, uh, you're really getting a good glimpse of how that works. Uh, Michigan State has a fantastic program with the reInvent uh, Law Lab, doing some very cool stuff. Um, and they're, they're good friends, and I think they're going to be very, very influential going forward. Um, so I ask each of you, is as you advance your careers, try to think how can you use technology to make your lives better? You only have so many hours in a day. There's only so much you can do with what you have. If you use some data to make your life better, to work faster, more efficiently, more quickly, you'll be more successful. Think of how this will affect your uh, lawyers who might not be accustomed to this. I think there's going to be a huge culture shock coming in the not too distant future where lawyers soon realize that their uh, you know, millennia old cartel isn't quite as strong as they thought it was. And think of how you can package these things to make it more palatable. This isn't about replacing lawyers, it's about helping lawyers make better decisions. That's why I say assisted decision making. This is using Westlaw and Lexis, which is dumps re research for you. This will be like using Google. And one last thing just to, to keep in mind, think of how you can contribute to this technology and how you can help develop it. You'll study this stuff. you learn how it works. Think of different innovations, simple as apps, simple as a program, simple as a website that can revolutionize how you guys practice law. We're really sitting at the cusp of great things to come. And I'm just so excited that I can be here to share it all with you. And thank you very much for your time. Please, any, any questions? Yes, sir. All right, so um, going more specifically to your decision-making process as well as your heart of that, though. Um, now, your, your user base is very beautiful. I want to say that. Um, how are you automating the system through processes of your information when you're doing that? And we're talking about the Google case, so how are you? I think that would require an NDA to answer. Uh, Non-disclosure. So I mean, there are, there are certain things which I'm working on technology. I mean, roughly, it's using SQL and some sort of back end, like elementary predictive coding, roughly speaking. But it gets a little bit more complicated than that. And I can maybe You're talk to you offline. A SQL programmer, so you know. He's, he's yeah, I, I can talk to you afterwards. But it, but a lot of it's stuff I'm kind of working on internally. And so. you know, Processing yeah, in that. Or yeah, I mean that. That's kind of that's kind of what we're we're going for. Um, the, the the general gist and, and what I can say is the way entries are put into Pacer are somewhat formulaic, yeah. and when you have a formulaic notation system, it's not too difficult to teach a computer to learn what is that going on. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and we we can talk later after that, but I don't don't want to get too bogged down in code. Oh, please, please. Um, the Pacer. Is there a way to get the same data out of the state court, or are you going to log in and pay for that? Yeah, I'll talk about that with you later. It's actually, yeah, I've, I've, I'm just curious. Yeah, no, no, it's, it, no, you're asking the exact right questions. It's very, um, it's very precarious working with U.S. courts, and they're not, they're not very, in, in all aspects, uh, and even when you're trying to get data from them. So I've, I've been working on this for a while, so I'm, you know, I'll talk with you a bit later if you want off offline. Yeah. I think there's a question here. Yeah, um, it seems like your Hollywood program really went on 
system? What? Yes. And also U.S. bankruptcy courts as well. Um, a lot of that is free. Um, and I've been talking to some bankruptcy lawyers. It's another possible application. Um, I, I know, I know, Dan, you've done a lot of work with the bankruptcy courts. Tax court. Uh, tax, oh, tax court, I'm sorry, yeah. But the bankruptcy court is actually another definite possible application. So I've, I've been looking at a lot of courts. I'm using district court too because it's the most prominent. People, most federal litigators are in district court, and probably patent is a smaller subset, and tax and bankruptcy are smaller subsets. But you're absolutely right. Um, there's a lot of application of legal um, legal uses of data that really are not being exploited, and the program which I'm, I'm thinking about developing would, would really, using NLP or some sort of technology, would really apply to a lot of various uh, courts. I'm gonna I'm not sure use my fast prerogative. Please. I found the cookies, and so if anyone would like to take the cookies, please go ahead and take some if you don't mind the interruption. Please, no, no, okay. go for it. So that's in the back, question please. Yeah, uh, you have two different approaches to legal services with the McFarland and then the, the lawyer side. Are you planning on more driving your services to lawyers or to those seeking legal services? So, so the answer is going to be both and it's going to be tiered. Um, a lot of the information will be available to the public and a lot of it will be at a, a charge. Um, my, my, my mission is to make the data available publicly free. But if you want my analysis, you have to pay for it. So if you want to research, you know, what are cases being filed and what are motions being filed, that, that's going to be no charge. But if you want to know what percentage of motions for summary judgment is this judge granting for plaintiffs, that's, that's going to be the analysis which we provide. And I'm probably going to build some sort of API because there are a lot of other uh, practice management softwares and billing softwares that would be very good to, to suck this data in. Right there, sir, you have a question? Really? That's good. Great minds, sir. Um, going back to the point you made earlier about copyright and abuse, um, I'm not really like really into this other question here. Um, aren't the groups supposed to be public and open? So that's a counter argument. I mean, you can file copyright in anything, and they'll grant it to you. But the question is whether the copyright's valid. And there's some First Amendment arguments there. And there's also some arguments saying if you submit it to a public court, you you waived it. And that, that case, as far as I know, is still pending in SDNY. I, I haven't seen the resolution of it yet, but I know it's still pending. Okay. Um, and I'm watching that with some, with some, with some interest because if the, I mean, it's, it's also Judge Rakoff is insane, but he's usually a pretty good judge. Um, depending how that one comes out, a lot I'm of not things. Reporting that. You may be talking that to the web, but I'm not reporting that. That's okay. Yeah. No, I mean, he, he, he's, he's a very prominent judge, but he, he's, uh, he's known for, for kind of stepping out on his own. Um, yeah, actually, it's actually funny. There was um, oh, I'll tell the story that we recorded. No, but there was there was one uh, there, there was one law student who like was was uh, sitting in his courtroom for some whatever reason. She sent him a letter about something, and he told her to shut up, or told her like don't correct me or don't say anything. He's a very 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 interesting guy. All right, other questions. Any other questions? Are there, are and I guess it's sort of a, I'm sitting in the last one with anyone else has 5.30 on a, on a Thursday afternoon if you want to get going. Or just get their cookies when it's possible or as quickly as possible. I have a question for you. If you do it, you have to define the nature of the problem that you're trying to solve. And you know, that's an issue because I mean, some prediction is, is easy, some prediction is hard. And I mean, particularly whether it's a hard problem. Um, and predicting the likelihood of, you know, the uh, point toss is relatively easy toss. Mm -hmm. And so it, it seems to me, if you're going to make progress in there, you have to find what the problem is. And, and that's a really difficult thing to walk because we don't really have a model for how judges make decisions. And, and so I guess, you know, this is sort of a theory data question. So right. At some level, you know, you have to. Yeah, and I'll answer your question in a second, but the other danger 
is also ossification. Um, and by that I mean if the common law evolved, and now I can put my, I'm also a common law guy as well, but the common law evolved the way it did because things changed. People found that things were good or bad and they slightly modified the common law. With data, things don't change. If we simply say because we did X in the past, we have to do X today, there's no X prime, there's no variation. And one of my concerns for my own product is that if I'm successful, it might actually lead to kind of the ossification or the solidification of the law and not allowing it to evolve. I don't think it'll ever happen. And maybe I'm just a crazy theorist, but it's actually something on my mind. Now to answer your question, I don't I don't think we need an attitudinal model of how judges decide cases. I don't think that's necessarily useful. I think it'll be helpful enough to know that if this certain judge said, you know, a personal injury case of a certain nature, he's had 10 in the last five years, and here's how I rolled each of them, that's good enough information for me to run with. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't need a numerical statistical prediction of how each judge will decide based on his ideology and his, you know, history and other things. All I need to know is how has a judge decided in the past and that will help me litigate smarter. And I would be happy with just that. Um, even with the Supreme Court prediction market, you know, we have these predictions, but they're not perfect. You know, we can generate with degrees of statistical certainty. So if we're like 99% certain, or maybe 95% confident, or 90% confident, we can indicate that. So say if there's a certain judge who with personal injury cases in the past decade, he's dismissed 25 of them in summary judgment, and he's only let one go to trial. That's probably a pretty good indication that your personal injury case won't go anywhere. Maybe not, maybe it might be that one, but that's something you should know. And that will be helpful to know when you're following a case in a certain jurisdiction. Or maybe when you're talking settlement. Because if you know this judge won't rule in your favor, you may want to settle this one out. Get something rather than nothing. So to answer your question, I have a very strong um, you know, interest in legal theory. It's what I do my other half of my life. So I, I love theory. Um, and I'm trying to accept I can to impart that into this into this model so it actually can account for the fact that judges are human. Um, a lot of this stuff is going to be like flipping a coin. A lot of this going to be really tough. And um, the algorithms will get more and more and more sophisticated, which is why now I'm just working on simple things like saying, you know, how many of these cases go this way? How many cases go this way? So it's a pretty simple judgment for plaintiff or judgment for defendant. That's, a, that's, a, that's an easy characterization. Sir? Yeah, I was thinking that if anything, this is what justifies partners of our seven, eight year experience in practice attorneys for charging their fee. If anything, this will bring the prices of, you know, his associates really do the groundwork, they mm -hmm. do the human element. Really, a partner is just this amassed body of information that tends to expedite the thing that's really justified the experience. So, the, the major enemy, I think, for this would be the you know, old guys. Yeah, and, and, and I think you're right. I mean, from a marketing perspective, the younger guys are going to be more interested in this because it'll, it'll cut back the number of hours they have to do and it will equalize a lot. One thing this will have to do is equalize the playing field. So now someone who doesn't have you know, a Kirkland and Ellis type budget with thousands, I mean, if you go to any big law firm like a Kirkland and Ellis or Mayor Brown, they have files on every judge. They have internal files in every case that they've had before this judge and they know this stuff. They have internal files in opposing law firms. They know this stuff. Small law firms don't have that. So this will equalize the playing field. But even their files, whatever files they do have, can be woefully incomplete because it's only limited to those cases they were involved in. This is like taking all the files and consolidating them. Sir? Actually, there's someone else in this room. So maybe you're looking at the And someone's going to probably put this back in the back of the round. Right next door. Right next door. Right next door. Okay, well. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, yeah, come on up for questions, please.